Why is it that almost 80 years later, after the famous Taconic essay on the primacy of the common good, is the Catholic tradition more confused than ever? Because we are, face it, the, the main institutional carrier into modern times of uh, tradition of thinking about common good. Uh, and the confusion doesn't just cover people in the pews who don't even know enough to be confused yet, but it, it covers the uh, ex expositors and guardians of our doctrine. Uh, the deep and by this point in time, almost silent reason for this. The canary already died in the coal mine. <laughs> the deep reason is that the magisterial social teachings and the commentary on these teachings very rarely summon the infrastructure of the perennial philosophy. So we're now 50 plus years into uh, uh, our Catholic experience since John the 23rd, in which it would be possible to go through the entire Roman Curia and every Curia of every bishop's conference in the world and no one would know the first four sentences of this, much less what you just did. Uh, and this is, this is crippling. But I'm not going to just go into that one. Uh, I will summon it, but I'm not going to give a lecture on it. I want to bring into view another cause for the confusion of our tradition, social philosophy, one that began, was already beginning by the time of, of the Deconic Eschmann debate. Uh, and after about five pontificates now, it has not been properly named, much less tamed. I call it giganticism. That is to say, social thought that defaults to social phenomena so general and abstract that no concrete society is brought into view. In Book Three of the Rhetoric, Aristotle advises that to speak well is to speak using specific names for things and not generic ones, not using ambiguous terms and avoiding these unless one chooses to do the contrary which is, in fact, what people do when they have nothing to say but pretend to say something nonetheless. Indeed, for our tradition, as Catholics, we do prefer these days to use terms like the workings of society, life of society, sectors of society, which if you throw in a few cliches, when, in which we use the word solidarity or dialogue or a culture of something, of death, the throwaway, so on and so forth. It's pretty much as far as we penetrate with words into what is I take to be the primary subject of common good, if the metaphysics haven't been done, which is understanding a society and the difference between different societies. Yes, the workings of society, life of society, and so forth, none of which really locate either in words or in thought a real social form. Almost never do we distinguish. Check the literature out. I think we have to actually go back into the late 1940s. Distinguish between soci sociability as such and the tendency to exist in a particular society uh, as a part or a member of a social whole. Everything depends on that distinction. Sociability as such, it only requires intersubjectivity in some language. It's everywhere. It's at the Mets game. It's in the piazza. It's on Zoom. It's going on everywhere. It's sociability. But that must be distinguished between, from the tendency to exist in a society as a part to the whole. Everything depends on this. And when we retract over and over again from a specific social form, we inevitably pay the price of abandoning 
the idea of a social end. Without social form, the concept of common good has no useful work to do. And with that, the concept inevitably tends to be folded into cliches, uh, mostly designed for exhorting us to social action rather than understanding it. Okay, the focal case in point. Two definitions and a hapless response. In his magisterial study, The Common Good in Late Medieval Political Thought, Oxford, 1999, Matthew Kempshall shows that despite the range of debates over bonum commune among the medieval schoolmen, we can detect a consensus about the essential features of the subject. Common good of a human society is a duplex ordo, a twofold order. If you don't get both, you're going to make a mess of things. First, the intrinsic common good, which is the form of order among two or more agents who engage in common action. Right. Uh, substantial forms won't do here. Right. Because when two or more human agents in, uh, engage in common action, they don't turn into a third substance or into one substance. Right. Uh, that belongs to God. We shouldn't try it at home. Uh, three persons in one substance. But for human beings, uh, social union, the intrinsic common good, is what Aristotle and Aquinas call form of order. It's real, but it's a social form. It's not a substantial form. And of course, the extrinsic common good, which is the end or the goal, maybe ends even, in some cases, of the social form. Wherever these two notions of common good are at work in a real human association, we can verify that we're talking about the same thing that attracted the attention of Aristotle, the medieval schoolmen, the social magisterium of the church until about the second half of the 20th century. If you know what to look for, you can pick it out. But only then, having picked out actual concrete instances of a duplex ordo, common action, common end, can we move along to other questions concerning different species of human association, some of which satisfy the definition simpliciter, while others perhaps are borderline instances of a duplex order. They're still indeterminate with regard to social form or to a fixed one. And then there would be, yet again, very interesting political and even metaphysical questions about particular forms and finalities of different associations. Beginning with Augustine, Book 19, uh, Sections 5 to 9 of the City of God, vita socialis is threefold, familial, civil, and ecclesial. They're called necessary societies because they're necessary for human flourishing. Uh, two are organic, or called organic, and one is supernatural. And the duplex or ordo can be verified in each of them. By the way, it was never held to my knowledge through two millennia of Christian thought about a com social common good as a duplex ordo that only these three had it. That's another question, whether there's more than three. But these have been picked out as verifiable and as absolutely crucial to human flourishing. Now, most everyone who studies Catholic social teaching is familiar with the conflicting definitions of common good in the compendium of the social doctrine of the Catholic Church. Quote, the principle of the common good to which every aspect of social life must be related if it is to attain its fullest meaning stems from the dignity, unity, and equality of all people. According to its primary and broadly accepted sense, the common good indicates the sum total of social conditions which allow people, either as groups or as individuals, to reach their fulfillment more fully and more easily." Unquote. Then there's a footnote in the text, and then the very next sentence, the common good does not consist in the simple sum of particular goods of each subject of a social entity. Belonging to everyone and to each person, it is and remains common 
because it is indivisible and because only together is it possible to attain it, increase it and safeguard its effectiveness. Now, the first thing to note is that what was called the primary and broadly accepted definition uh, is not primary, although it may be broadly accepted. No social form is included in the definition, although presumably societies having real social form are parts of that aggregate. There is a hint, perhaps, of a common end, but without form, there can be no concrete end. If you have a definition that has no social form, you are not prepared yet to infer a social end. While this definition is an instance of social thought working under the burden of what I'm going to be calling giganticism, it does not satisfy either prong of the duplex ordo profile. At best, it indicates conditions external to whoever and whatever is commonly affected. And this definition is wrong just in the way that an incomplete induction is wrong. It needed to know a lot more. The second definition struggles a bit, but it clearly aims to supply what's missing in the first, namely social form and finality. The definition highlights what JP2 called a social subject, to wit, a common end pursued by multiple agents who enjoy an indivisible form of order, which is the bond or the communion. And here, in such a case, we can match up the adjective social with the proper noun, a society, or family, or polity. The chief thing missing in that second definition can be found in the catechism. So if you go to the catechism, there's, there's more good stuff there to, to help us flesh out a definition. In section 1910, we read, each human community possesses a common good which permits it to be recognized as such. Then, equipped now with the definition and the notion that there's going to be an analogy that we're going to have to work with. Analogies are going to be crucial on this. If each uh, social entity having the duplex ordo has a common good, and it's not the same as the other one, we can go on to uh, even understand the principle of subsidiarity, which depends on that one. But here's the complication. In his encyclical Caritas and Veritate, 2009, Benedict cites this passage of the sum total of social conditions and then applies it to what he calls the institutional mediation of the polis. Quote, another important consideration is the common good. To love someone is to desire that person's good and to take effective steps to secure it. Besides the good of the individual, there is a good that's linked to living in society, common good. It's the good of all of us. It is a good that is sought not for its own sake, but for the people who belong to the social community and who can really and effectively pursue their good within it." Unquote. Given the language of love that Benedict is using throughout the encyclical, he seems poised to recover this duplex ordo model of common good, uh, but not loved for its own sake, throws up a roadblock. Because for the per perennial philosophy, the virtues of charity and general justice are called architectonic virtues because of their immediate, their immediate object is the common good precisely as an end. They mobilize all of the other virtues according to the dignity of that end, which is either temporal or supernatural. In other words, uh, the one thing you really do have to love for its own sake is the common good. And there's two virtues which are architectonic with regard to that. Uh, I can't believe Benedict didn't know that. So I'm going to make uh, a very polite Catholic move on this and say, Surely one of his assistants in this, in this encyclical intended to furnish a comment on that first definition of common good, sum total. Uh, because actually, sum total is not lovable for its own sake, I don't think. 
Uh, in fact, that aggregation of goods and conditions has insufficient unity to, to even be loved, I think. Maybe there can be some mere validity for some parts of it, but it, it, it is not a, a subject to be loved. Uh, and then the aid uh, looked around for a way to express that. But I, I couldn't find the expression in any pontifical document. I mean, going back. Not left for its own sake in connection with common good. I remember where it was. It's in the compendium. The compendium is one stop shopping for confusions on this. Uh, the, the quote was this The common good of society is not an end in itself. It has value only in reference to attaining the ultimate ends of the person and the universal common good of the whole of creation. God is the ultimate end of his creatures, and for no reason may the common good be deprived of its transcendent dimension. Well, what they're citing here is John Paul II's Centesimus Annus, where John Paul criticized Marxism for holding that human alienation can be remediated by only by a worldly collective. Thus, John Paul insisted Human societies must remain open to a transcendent common good. But this warning is completely misleading when brought over into caritas and veritate, because it confuses a penultimate good with a merely instrumental good. Hey, Augustinians and Thomists know this. All of the virtues save charity are penultimate goods. All of our societies are penultimate goods. All the people we love for their own sake are penultimate goods from that point of view. Um, so this same assistant on Benedict's step surely just thumbed through the compendium and found that. It seemed to match up something, and there it is. But if it's allowed to stand, this confusion reinforces the notion that a common good is to be loved only with amor concupiscentiae rather than amor amicitiae, love of friendship. We go to the very first article in Charity in the Secunda Secunde, 23.1. Love of friendship, that for, that for the sake of which other things are loved. The good I seek for my fellow traveler does not necessarily extend to my wish for his own good simply. In a partnership, I extend beneficence to my partners, and I want them to flourish, but ultimately for my own sake, or for the sake of my family or for the sake of whatever it is that I want to love simply. Thus, proposing to love someone for a brief and determinate span of time is not amor amicitiae. And to love a true social common good without amor amicitiae is to love it wrongly. Now, if the common good simply be the collection that Father Aquinas was speaking about, an order of things that are stockpiled or arranged for distribution, we might think of a parish that has lawns and a sprinkler system, parking spaces, things ordered to the parishioners who themselves perhaps are confused enough to call this common good. Obviously, their common good is not that stockpile. Their common good is that, well, first of all, it's the intrinsic common good. It is the form of order in which they have united action. In any case, the common good remains external, separate from the members, like a huge work of art. This is the crudest version of the liberal notion of common good, stockpiling of resources that is neither ordered to eudaimonia and excellence, nor to the social bonds of the individuals. Common good remains commonly affected. So this brings me to the issue of giganticism. That is the retraction in words and in ideas from social form. In the compendium, the principles of Catholic social teaching are introduced in this way. Quote, these are the principles of a general and fundamental character since they concern the reality of society in its entirety. Indeed, entirety, if one means the sum total of social phenomena. 
no social form is given. This is at its best, I suppose, a reference to sociality in general that might be determined by a form if we get around to it. Perhaps this helps to explain you see, uh, a, a certain manner of thought that wants to reach the most extensive human organizations. Uh, later we read, social charity makes us love the common good. Uh, to love uh, people considered not only as individuals or as private persons, but also the social dimension that unites them. And I take this to mean the whole world with a social dimension, which I also take to be sociality in general. Such depiction of the entire ensemble of social things as a society is deeply embedded in our contemporary Catholic social teaching. Indeed, in the paragraph of Gaudium et Spes, where the sum total model of common good is announced, we read that the subject of all this is human interdependence spreading over the whole world. And this social order is called the entire human family. Boy, we want a specific name more than that. Um, in his introduction to the mystery of the church, the Dominican ecclesiologist, Father Benoit Dominique, notes that the dogmatic tradition of the people of God theme, and here I'm quoting, has been affected by the vicissitudes of the developments of social philosophy in the modern era. The ambiguity of the word society was and may still be such that it very often was difficult to correctly understand the thought of one author or another, not to mention the excesses resulting from an inept use of sociological schemes. So for example, a people can mean something other than an institution in the way an assembly at prayer is something different than the pews, the prayer books, the rituals, and so forth. Or, completely in the opposite direction, an institution can be the condition of the possibility for the existence of a people, as when we say that God twice instituted the matrimonial social form. The sky is the limit here until we get serious about what we want to talk about. People can mean by a people the entire demographic entirety. Or it can mean St. Augustine's mystical typology of the two cities. I think this problem is what this, the, the world of social phenomena looks like today uh, beginning at about mid 20th century and certainly increasing in our time, at least to those principalities and powers who are prepared with goodwill to act on those social things to build a better world, world as the cliche goes. Church and civil authority were called upon after World War II to face an enormously complex aggregation of things that were quickly changing, needing to be directed to good ends. The first neo-scholastic philosopher to worry about this problem, so far as I know, was Yves Simon uh, in an essay called Beyond Liberalism, 1942. Simon notes, we can no longer content ourselves with asserting and reasserting principles which can afford to be unquestionably true because they lie on such a sufficiently high level of abstraction. We can no longer content ourselves with uttering statements which are so thoroughly disentangled from historical contingencies that no historical occurrence can invalidate them. So indeed, the scale and complexity of social things post-1945 uh, directed the social imagination, if we want to put it that way, to gigantic things. Once upon a time, when the, when the Social magisterium was just beginning, uh, late 19th century. Uh, the social world was seen almost entirely through the lens of social forms. Just the opposite. In matrimony, form and matter is fixed. One man, one woman, and an act of union for the purpose of sacrament, for the purpose of children, and so on and so forth. In family, form and end are fixed 
but the matter is variable. Yeah, you can end up having three kids or one kid or two kids, right? All girls, or all boys. In church, form and end are fixed, but the matter is once again variable, right? It could end up that everyone who ends up being saved is uh, only men or women. Unlikely. In polity, form is variable. There, there are four legitimate forms of polity, right? Uh, kingship, or monarchy, aristocracy, a kind of democratic republic, or a mixture of, of the three is a fourth one. Form is variable, but the end is fixed in polity. And of course, polity too is indeterminate to matter. This is why Pius XI felt, uh, 12 felt comfortable enough uh, the year after the Second World War in a consistory of, uh, for, for making cardinals to concede that the church will have to be much more open to the democratic form of polity because it helps people to see the difference between the social forms of the church and the state. Because the church does not have a democratic form, strictly speaking. So, and things were simple. Things were simple then because for more than 100 years of Catholic social thought, uh, all of the fighting issues had to do with form and end. I'll just give you some examples, and you can fill in more for yourself. The social form of matrimony by nature and by sacrament as against civil divorce. The entire debate was over form and end, and who got to call the shots on it? it do the contractors call the shots? Does the state call the shots? Does the church call the shots? Thoroughly, form and end of a social entity question. Social form and end of the family as against, for example, mandatory state education. The difference between the social forms and ends of church and state. Or the big one in the late 19th century for Leo is ralliement, whether a Catholic country could adopt a Republican form of government. It was a fighting issue. It remained a fighting issue all the way through Vichy. And for some, French, it still is a fighting issue. Okay. Now, these, these popes and these Catholic thinkers, remember, they're, they're all trained in scholastic philosophy. Most of them were trained in canon law. I can think of only one pope for all of those years that didn't have a canon law degree. And canon law at least encourages the mind to put real names on things and good definitions. Okay. Uh, economic issues of the late 18, 1890s complicated this a bit. But even then, Leo and Rerum Novarum managed to focus on the social form and finality of the worker, family, and guild. Even more complicated economic issues arose during Pius XI's pontificate that were not easily understood on a scholastic basis. Even so, Pius focused on corporations, public and private, in uh, Quadragesimo Anno. These guys knew what they were looking for, and they had specific names for it. And they engaged in public debates on that, on that scale. But by 1960, things had changed. More than 50% of the world's population was undergoing decolonization and other huge demographic dislocations, remaking geographical, political, and economic orders all, all across the world. Global communications in real time. First and Second World Wars, ideologies, problem with the global south emerging, nuclear weapons, the need for multilateralism. Oh, my. Everyone had to learn to think like a global manager. And not surprisingly, the social teachings began to change. I, I, I can pinpoint it, actually. It's Mater Magistra. Popolorum Progressio, a few years later, really evinces this. How does it change? Uh, they wanted to look at huge historical and social forces, which the whole world was interested in. Uh, new curial offices 
were invented and others were redesigned to provide a constant platform for this new style of papal prudence about social matters. It's, it's big. And by the turn of the millennium, the entire operation of Catholic social uh, teachings was fed through the Department of State, through communications, papal travels, Council of Justice and Peace, uh, and other curial bodies turning out volumes of social commentary every week. We're just flooded with them. No one could even hope to read all of them. Um, Populorum is the one to be studied. Development is a new name for peace. And the new name for peace is called the New Humanism. And the New Humanism is called the New World Order. Uh, the Pope urged us, organize, stimulate, coordinate, and put in place an effective world authority. These issues are grave, urgent, and critical. It reminds me somewhat of uh, John Kennedy's New Frontier, right? except on Adderall or something. Now, I think this, this explains this lure toward global managerial way of looking at the world, kind of sociologically in a way. Explains why in the compendium, there's 10 times more space given to international conferences about clean water than to the three modes of justice. Uh, they reported what was on their mind. Uh, by the way, they usually are pretty good on marriage and family. And this surely justifies the Holy Spirit placing the Sea of Peter in Italy, because they rarely make mistakes on family. Uh, for his part, John Paul II, realizing the global situation and the difficulty of making sense of it and even having words about it that made sense, uh, invented the virtue of solidarity precisely to cover the aggregational and global social phenomena that is to speak of how there could be some kind of a moral order from a distance scaled across all these massive forces. Alas, it quickly became called communion, which is the opposite of sharing in someone's life even without a common life. And in Fratelli, sol solidarity is now recast as solidarity understood in its most profound meaning as a way of making history which sounds pretty gigantic to me, right? Uh, and, by the way, <clears throat> Francis gives no cover or support for the merely aggregational stuff. When you read Francis, whenever that comes up, he knows it's, it's, it's neoliberalism. You've got to stop it right there. The problem is, rather than just admitting it really is just aggregational, he calls it communion which is kind of fusing the wrong word on the wrong phenomenon. Uh, so in Fratelli, just for example, family denotes a real family eight times. It is used metaphorically 27 times. We need to brush up on the fallacy of misplaced concreteness here. Uh, social, as an adjective, modifies a real social entity 15 times but no social body whatsoever 56 times. The more gigantic, in general, the social phenomena, the more the social magisterium is, in, is inclined to crown these phenomena with the word that usually denotes social form, which is communion. In sections 142 and 146 of Fratelli, the word local is now applied to home and family and culture but and here we're going to get to the notion of particular in social theory. But local denotes uh, a primary social entity very abstractly according to quantity, right? Local versus regional versus global is quantity. It's, it's place right? or its size. They're not social forms. They're just quality, uh, of quantitative predicates. You know, this is exactly, of course, what Aristotle and Thomas argued against, this sort of depiction of social forms as only varying quantitatively. But it's entirely in accord with that first definition that's in, the, in Gaudium et Spes of common good. 
which is more inclined to, to quantity as, as, as a collection. Marriage and family in our tradition always designates a particular, not a local entity. The word particular is important here, somewhat, somewhat different use of it than Father uh, Aquinas's. Particular means that you really are a social part inside another society. Right? It's like particular friendships in the house. Right. Particular actually implies a social order going on. Right. Uh, the, uh, so two, two distinctions have to be made. One is the distinction between sociability in general and actually being a part or a member in a social whole. Two, between that part which is qualitatively different than the whole but an authentic member of it. And you'll get subsidiarity. Subsidiarity can presuppose that the same five members of the family are also members of the polity and members in St. Rita's Parish without prejudice to any of those social forms. It's either true or false, but we have names for them. We have five different ways, I mean, those five people, three different ways in which they can be particular with regard to a whole as individuals and as members of other societies. Okay. And on the issue of Thomas using the term divinius, more divine of the more comprehensive community of, of polity or the city, he says, yes, melius et divinius, better and more divine, and the reason he gives, because includet omnes alia communitates. It includes more communities, not more members, but more communities. And therefore, uh, the, it has the dignity of a social form that includes all these other theaters of perfection. Right? You can't handle that quantitatively. Local, global, regional is not going to work for that one. And when you use the quantitative predicates, what does subsidiarity become? the lowest level or the lower level. Whereas in our tradition, it's always called proprium. It, it's the proper level. It's something that belongs to that group that has to be respected. Right? It's not just a local thing. Hey, families are everywhere. Uh, so I'm, I'm getting toward the end. In a very important book that was published 1954 on common good, and that was the era in which a lot of Catholic philosophers were really writing about it. This was a book, uh, and it was on common good justice. Anyway, they got Jacques Leclerc, who was the founder of the School of Political and Social Science at the Catholic University of Louvain, to write the introduction. And here's a few sentences from that introduction to indicate that people have been worrying about this in our tradition going back a few decades now. Quote, men occupied with practice interest themselves in the precepts of immediate application. Social philosophy also is scarcely studied except with preoccupations about immediate realization. As happens always, the practical men have the impression that the principles are sufficiently known, that they ought to be sufficiently known and feel certain irritation when someone regards it as still necessary to inquire into the subject. They have the idea that in re-examining the principles, one loses valuable time for action, and that in casting doubt on received formulas, one unnerves action. And yes, the leaders of global change are generally like this. Let's get along to action. We all know what common good means. Oh, it's right in the compendium. Uh, leave your books in the attic. It, it's, it's time to change the world. It, interestingly, uh, Paul VI, after Popolorum Progressio, received a very tepid welcome. He thought he was doing just, just the right thing. But, of course, the uh, south of the border, the, the nascent liberation theologians hated it 
because it was the it was the Roman pontiff giving ideological justification for socio-economic development fed by first world banks that were coming into uh, countries in South America and well it, as a kind of occupier and uh, back then it was liberals who complained they they, they complained that his scheme was so big, it left nothing for lay people to do, for heaven's sakes. Uh, and so he kind of changed his mind. And on the 80th anniversary of uh, Rerum Novarum, sent a letter, Octogesima Albanians, over to the uh, Council on Justice and Peace. And he only uses the word doctrine once. By the way, the subtitle was A Call, a call to Action. And uh, he, he sort of admits that everything is so big, uh, Rome simply is not competent to track all this stuff. And it's going to have to be tracked and commented on at, at lower levels or at regional levels or whatever they are. Uh, but he also said something else. He said, section 48, it is a goal of Catholic social teaching to enlighten, but its main goal is to prompt action. Get to it. And uh, we're, we're still under that mindset. I mean, if, if there's a worldwide recession, the Pope has to issue something. Bishops' conferences have to. And they're written in such a way that uh, they're much more on the side of exhortation than they are of understanding. So. That's sort of like a Petrine Davos meeting that's made to feel a bit more like a communion. But humanity as a whole, when the most recent encyclical, charity is what unites the abstract and the institutional, embracing everything. It's just a confetti of uh, exhortation. So here's my thought experiment. I'll end on this. If tradition is to regain reality, it needs a rectification of words. And here we can turn to Confucius in the 13th book of the Analects, reports how a ruler was uh, summoned a new administrator of the government. And the ruler asks the new administrator, what will you consider to be the first thing done? And the master replied, what is necessary is to rectify names. So indeed, said the ruler, you are wide of the mark. Why must there be such a rectification? And the master said, how uncultivated you are. A superior man in regard to what he does not know shows cautious reserve. If names be not correct, language is not in accordance with the truth of things. And if language be not in accordance with the truth of things, affairs cannot be carried on to any success in this kingdom. And it's true that words bespeak habits of mind about things in action. A diplomatic use of words is not the same thing as a scientific use of words. Words exhorting to action are not the same as those needed for philosophically understanding it. Words as cliches, placeholders in dialogue, that keep dialogue alive, even while leaving the depth of the issue to one side, is a particular use of words. It's not always evil. So confusion of words needs to be rectified by reality. And here's my thought experiment. Tradition has it that Aristotle, when he was studying political regimes, had his students at the Lyceum collect information on the political organization and history. And they came back with 158 different documents by tradition. It was field work for the study of constitutions. It was basically field work to understand the intrinsic form of order in polities. This is what we need today, something like this. Maybe, maybe the Dominicans can organize it. A team of, team of four or five, maybe four or five countries, we should take advanced modernity as the test case. And we need, them to, we need these uh, students trained in philosophy. And they probably need at least some social science training. Uh, they definitely need curiosity about life. And I think of these teams as being like those 
famous Dominicans and Franciscans in the 16th century who had books. They made books with the studies of all the plants, all of the religious dress, the religious articles of the Aztecs. They had books reporting to the king of Spain uh, what words they used for these things, what rituals they performed. Except we need this now for the 21st century. And this, these teams being adequately trained uh, are, are to be trained in asking four questions. The first two are ontological, the second two are moral. First, who belongs to whom? Not propriety in the sense like ownership of an automobile or a slave. Rather, I mean social membership. Two or more persons holding themselves out to the rest of the world as one, at least with respect to their specific social bond. Who belongs to whom? Listen, when I was in high school, we asked this all the time. About junior year, everyone's interested who belongs to whom. <laughs> Who's got who and whose ring, right? It's basic. It doesn't take a lot of philosophy to do this investigation. Uh, married persons, for example, uh, uh, probably are not regarded as one in every respect. But what do they think about their matrimonial union? Which unions or belonging one to the other can be bought and sold? It'd be a basic question that has to be asked. Uh, two, for what purpose or ends? What are they trying to perfect through their union? Maybe they'll stumble, like one of Aristotle's students, will stumble upon the preamble to the US Constitution in order to form a more perfect union. And then they give the reasons, extrinsic common good, domestic tranquility, securing the blessings of liberty for future generations, et cetera, et cetera. So the first two are ontological. And they, they, they should be, how to put it, they, they should have great curiosity and circumspection, too. They should look all around and see what the world is going on and ask people what they're doing. This is an Aristotelian principle. Ask people what they think they're doing when they're doing it. The next two are moral. What do the members owe to one another? Surely actions and things, but what sort of actions and things? Okay. Correlatively, what do the rest of you owe to that society? JP2 once commented that the family is a social subject that transcends the sum of its parts, and to it we owe honora. Honora is owed, which is kind of recognition, honor. Honor of its social form, that we never treat the family as though it were just a dormitory, right? Uh, we also should ask questions on this moral level of wh who owes what to whom, uh, what they think of uh, social inclusion and distributions. Be very interesting. Four, what kind of love is owed? What kind of owed love is owed binding them together? Do they really love their union for its own sake, with Amor Amicizia? Or do they love their union for the sake of other loves? And this kind of study, uh, with intelligent circumspection, will reveal quite a lot, beginning with whether or not we really need our older language of social form and finality. That is, whether it matches with reality. Uh, and it will also help us to deal with what's probably the greatest problem of early 21st century, which is uh, associations, social associations, which are indeterminate to form or having no fixed one. The, the associations studied by social capital theorists, in which you, what you want to know is how many, how many clubs do you belong to? Motorcycle club, Knights of Columbus, and uh, choir. Uh, so we want to know about those kinds of organizations. Last thought is, you know, the famous Case and Deaton, the economist, 
Princeton social scientist who came out three years ago with that fantastic, uh, disturbing study of social mortality and morbidity among undereducated white males. Now, they were good social scientists. That is, they weren't thinking like Father Aquinas or me. They were actually looking at data, and they were correlating the data. And it's quite amazing what they, what they discovered. Uh, across the country, what three things are correlated with one another for very high levels of uh, mortality and morbidity? First, data. People who are so angry at their government, they don't even like the mayor, much less the president. True alienation from polity. Two, stop going to church. Very interesting, especially in the regions of the country they did this study in, which are church-going regions. Right. Three, divorce, loss of relations to even your children and grandchildren. Oh, well, holy smokes, those are, the, those are the three necessary societies, right? Uh, th they need to be carefully attended to, 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 under to be understood, because they're obviously a lot more important than your bowling team or your motorcycle club. Right? This is the kind of thinking we should be doing. Uh, it, it, it would be the kind of thinking that would lead to some falsifiable things. You see if our words really matching up, whether our ideas are really matching up, uh, it, it will surely lead to something better than the giganticism that we're engaged in now, which is, is neither philosophical or scientific. 